public world, public events, something is worship. Because worship is something that devotes your time. So if something devotes your time, other than religion, then you're worshiping something other than religion. Something that devotes your time, takes up your time. And you think, well, I don't do anything other than work. Maybe work is a form of your worship. Well, I don't do anything. I don't go home from work. I just sit in front of a TV. I don't do anything else. Well, there again, something devotes your time. So in that respect, anything that devotes your time is in the form of worship. And sometimes people that consider the fact, well, I'm not kneeling in front of it. I'm not praying to it. So then it realistically is a worship. No, no. The aspect is, up your time, it has control of you. So therefore, you allow that object, that, that person, that event, whatever, to take up your time. And therefore, it's a form of worship. So we get into Daniel chapter 3. We're not going to read through it all. But is there anything in there that is very outstanding or that something in those verses that really brings to light the idea of worship. Is there anything in those verses that you really, really brings something to you? And that's something that you can definitely say, now there is a true form of worship. get to the sort of this first part, I mean get to the middle of the chapter, chapter 3. Now if you're in chapter 15, in verse 15, now if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, larry, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, you good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is, the, who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? Was this a true form of worship? Was Nebuchadnezzar asking them to worship? It's a classic question. Did he ask them to worship? He asked them to bow down. He asked them to make recognition of when you hear the music, you are to fall down and worship the image which I have made. And that is good. But if you don't, then that is bad. What was the uh, three Hebrews remark? If it is this day that we do not bow down and if we shall die because of it, then it is A lot of people have always, this is a very common question, a common thought. Why does it hurt to kneel? Even if you have no devotion to worship the item, why does it hurt to kneel? What are you giving up by doing that? You have no intention to pray to where is the problem with that? Is there a problem with that? Are you still devoting your time? I mean, you're not truly devoting it. You can't go anywhere else at that time. You can't go anywhere else. You're being forced to do it. You're giving into that. Well, okay, so you're being forced. Yeah, because if you didn't, what would happen? Are there consequences for not worshiping the true God? There's still consequences in that. There's consequences no matter what. But if you choose to worship the true God, there's a reward for it, right? Okay. Is there a reward for doing counterfeit? What's where's the line of being counterfeit? Where do you draw the line? Beyond 
this line? Who draws up that line? Let me ask this. How many of you go to another church, have gone to another church other than this one, or if, not, if some of you might not even be of this church, yet you might be, be here, but yet if you go to another church that does not worship in the same manner that you do, just because you might go there with a family member, are you counterfeit now? You're attending another church that does not conform to what you believe, are you I know some individuals who are married, one of one faith, one of another, but yet out of respect for each other, they go to each other's church. They're firm believers in one church, but yet out of respect, which is, which is totally understandable. If we don't know the whole truth, then we're keeping the truth we have. We're not counterfeit. Okay, so if, if I don't know if I'm going to this church and I don't know about the Sabbath because I haven't been convicted of it yet, then the truth that I have and that I, that I stick to that truth and worship God the way I know I'm not counterfeit. Okay, so let's put it in perspective. If you were, if you know a God, if you know the truth and you practice it, and you attend church, and you practice it, but yet you go to another church, you know the truth. You're not practicing it in the other church, in another church. But as long as you know the truth, you're all right. You know in practice. You the truth that you have. Because what, you don't you? know the whole truth. And even if you go to the other church, uh, as a obligation to your spouse. The Protestant churches look so much the same and they're preaching so much of the same unless he's a Jew and you're a Protestant there's not that much difference. There's not much difference. No. Truly there is. Maybe just the day of the week but there's not much difference. Oh, there's sometimes a state of death, whatever. But yet, you can get a great sermon on Christ from any church. Right. Okay? Sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the formalities, uh, the parts, parts of the worship service, you might not agree with. Well, I might not agree with it because I haven't been convicted of it yet. Because why? I haven't been convicted of it. You haven't been convicted? Well, some individuals are convicted and they, they know the truth and yet... Not in, in yet, but they feel comfortable going to the other church. They're not practicing that religion, but the, out of respect, they're attending. Well, but that, you know, we're, there's sheep in other folds, and there's Definitely. no reason to ostracize another faith just because they don't have the whole truth. Definitely. But as long as you have the truth, you're not compromising anything. As long as you understand the truth and know the truth, you're not compromising but whatever church you go to, whatever temple. As long as I have the truth that God has given me. Because unless you go to a church, say the Seventh-day Adventist church, where they have more of the truth, then as long as God's not going to say, okay, well, you didn't know this, but I'm going to judge you on it anyway. Good. Good. Understand? So basically it's what your purpose is. What your purpose is. Okay? So as long as you don't have a purpose attending another church or temple sanctuary, as long as there's no purpose, you're just busy. Alright? You're not compromising anything? Well, is your purpose to 
attending another church, not of your own faith, the best thing you can do is to go there and to take part. But if you go there and you say, hey, what you guys are doing is wrong, you're not going to win anybody, right? Okay, so those three Hebrews, they should have got they could have gone there and attended this function and done and just taken part. Rather than stay and stand it up and say, hey, everybody here is wrong. Isn't that the same idea? So if we go to another church, we go there in a manner not to set, not to create diversity, but to and to fellowship and to win people over in a manner, but yet we don't go there to say, hey, everything you're doing wrong. I'm not going to take part in that because it's wrong. So why not let the three Hebrews kneel? Because they stood up there and they pretty much, pretty much just made the statement, hey, everybody here, you're wrong. We're gonna do, we're not gonna conform to this. We're doing it our way. This is this is totally wrong. You're all wrong. You want to go to another church and do that, would you?
they come out and said, Shadrach and, Sh Sh Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to, to answer you in this manner. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the God with the golden image which you have set up. In the manner that they responded, they said, whatever shall happen will happen, guaranteed, whether we live or die. But one thing about it, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to worship your idols. Whether or not we live from this point on, or whether or not we die, that's not up to us, but God. But we're not going to worship your idols. Now, they could have been a lot more uh, condemning. They could have told Nebuchadnezzar, oh, you are the most worthless heathen. Oh, God is going to take care of you. Because we're right, and you are wrong. And you're going to see that. Because God is going to take care of you. They didn't say that. He said, our life is in God's hands. That's all we're worried about. Whatever is going to happen, is going to happen. Sometimes it's how we respond to other people about our beliefs it needs to be something we need to be critical about. How do we respond in a situation like this? Now, there are times when we can try and be secret about it. And in the same in the scenario, a lot of people have questioned what happens if they would have just kneeled down on one leg and pray to God. That's the most common perception that everybody has had. What if? But God doesn't ask us to put a lot of what ifs into our religion. God says, put your faith and trust in me. I will take care of it. And that's what the Hebrew is depending on. What do 
underlying message. What is the importance? The first few verses talks about it pretty heavily. Verse 4, we will not hide them from their children. Tell him to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and the strength of his wonderful works that he has done. For he established the testimony of Jacob and appointed the law in Israel, which he commanded her fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be, would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. What is the importance here? Where do you see a family setting here? Family setting of teaching them, teaching what God has done for you to your children. And that's what it says here. Uh, Give ear, O people, O my people, to my law, and apply your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Dark sayings of old, the secrets of old, the, his, the historical events of old, the things that have been passed down from generation to generation that have suddenly stopped the progress because they have seemed to have lost their sight on the Lord. Now all those, not necessary secrets, but the, the, the great praises of old have stopped because they have lost their sight on the Lord. Everything that was supposed to have been given to the children about regards to how well God has taken care of them in the past, the, the uh, people, the fathers, the generations previous, it seems to have come to a halt. It seems to have been disregarded. It says, verse 8, And may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright, and the spirit was not faithful to God. It seems as how a rebellious generation has taken a, has has interrupted what God had established. Let your children know about the praises God has done for you. Let your children learn from your lifestyle, your devotion. Let your children learn from that, not only by watching you, but by listening. the idea of worship and education. Let the children know what has happened in the past. In Tuesday's lesson, in spirit and in truth, John chapter 4, 7-26, John 4, 7 through 26. Jesus coming to the well, to Jacob's well. And it says, A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, Ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you, ask who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well? drank from it himself, and, and as well as his sons and his livestock. So Jesus here coming to the well, all alone, sitting there waiting, this 
Samaritan woman comes out from the city to draw water. Jesus enters up a conversation with her. Now, this story has been broken up into at least four sections. One, the introduction and, and, and the way Jesus approaches this whole deal. Jesus enters in by general conversation. Can you give me something to drink? That is the first order of just opening up dialogue, social interaction. Opens it up for Jesus to get to the point of worship and religion. So, Jesus enters into the ask for a drink. She, she says, well, it's not quite conducive for you, being the righteous Jew, to ask me as a heathen Samaritan for a drink because you Jews do not like to take anything from a heathen because then you're unclean. Especially, it goes that we will find that as we discuss further in our lesson, the whole idea of clean basin jars and everything else like that, you do not accept anything from the Samaritan. So Jesus says, only if you knew truly the gift of God and what I can give you, you would not thirst, you would not thirst any longer because you would have the living water. And if you knew who I was, did she have any insight of what Jesus was talking about or who he possibly was? had not captured her attention yet, correct? He says living water. If you would only ask of me for this living water, you would be set for life. Her first thought was, seriously, there's better water than this well, and I know that it's probably a spring water that you're talking about. The living water, something coming out of the ground, something traveling, something that's bubbling up out of the ground. Living water, a spring. She was assuming you can't get better than that. She was definitely thinking that that would be great. And she's wondering, where did you find this spring that you're talking about? Verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will thirst, never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Is she any closer to understanding what Jesus is talking about? She is still thinking about talking about living, I mean, literal, natural water. She firmly believes that Jesus might have a secret or the possible known whereabouts of a spring where it is much more convenient for her to get the better water that she don't have to walk all the way out of town to this well and to to dip her uh, base a hundred foot down the ground and have to carry it all the way back to the home. Jesus said to her, go, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. 
Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And she goes again. She's trying to cut the conversation short. She implies, okay, you obviously are some type of prophet. You are Jewish. And yet you as Jews say that we are wrong as Samaritans to worship here up on the mountain above the well. But yet you Jews believe we're wrong because we don't worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me that the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. What did Jesus reply? What was His reply to her? What's the whole idea in regards to... What is the meaning of God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth? She was implying, her first idea was, worship is in a literal spot. You say we are wrong to worship here. You Jews believe it is correct and only proper to worship in Jerusalem. What is she implying? What, is, what did Jesus imply back to her that was trying to make her truly understand the true form? Trying to educate her in the idea of worship. What was her idea of worship? Let's gain that understanding. What is her idea of worship? First of all, it's in a, it's in a specific location. It has to be, she, she's implying, you Jews say it specifically has to happen at Jerusalem. You say we are wrong for worshiping up on top of the mountain above the well. Their temple was torn down in about the 2nd century B.C. by, the, uh, by a uh, priest, uh, the, uh, the head priest, uh, Hercules that was devout and devoted to trying to eradicate all heathens, heathen worship. And so from that point on, the temple was torn down on the mountain above Jacob's well. The Samaritans never did rebuild it, and so they didn't have the true temple to worship in. So then the idea of worship had sort of become abandoned. But yet the Jews says, truly, the only place to worship is in Jerusalem. What is her mentality of believing what worship is? Sometimes it's the same for us. Worship happens one day a week. It happens at church. If you don't get to church that week, then you didn't get any worship in. What is Jesus implying? God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. What's the whole idea of being God is spirit? Let me give you a scenario. I've been gone for the last couple months, and I meet, I meet all kinds of different people. And one individual come up to me, and, and we got to talk real quick. And I, I knew him. For, I, I got to know him in the previous month that I was at, at the, down there in Colorado. And just I don't know how we even got talking about it, but he just started rambling on. Super nice guy. He was from out of Idaho, and he was I, I'm going to say a logger profession, possibly. And so he got to talking about something. I don't remember how we got to the conversation, how we were just conversational. He was just, he just talking, talking. I'm just listening and, and we got talking about, he just, I think the comment was this as well. He says, I need proof of things. I really need to have proof before I really believe in something. He says, well, take for instance, he says, I get this 
lady at work. She just talks all the time about religion. She's the younger lady in our group. I like her, but she just talks about religion all the time, all the time. Just for the last 10 years, she talks about religion all the time. And I finally just told her, and I've told her several times, give me the proof, then I'll believe. Until that time, I'm not going to believe anything until I see the proof. And he looked at me and says, you go to church? Uh, okay, where am I going to go with this? I says, yeah? He says, oh, okay. He said, nothing against anybody that goes to church, but I'm just at that point. Let me know, just you, before I believe anything, you got to show me the proof in anything. And I'm thinking, okay, how do you respond? Before, before I even got anything out, we're already, something, the conversation has gone way past. Where is the proof in what Jesus, when, what Jesus said here? What is Jesus saying? God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. What is spirit? What is Jesus implying about God is spirit, and unless you worship in the correct way, you worship in spirit and in truth. What is it implying that God is spirit? Everybody here just for the. Everybody here just for the uh, 11 o'clock worship hour. Everybody here just for it. Just to get in the the daily dose of worship. What is spirit? You can't prove it, can you? Spirit is something that speaks to you personally. Correct? Like you said, unless you have a daily devotion with God, you can read the Bible, you can sit on the shelf, the Bible can be on your pillow day and night, but yet that thing is not doing you any good. Correct? Unless you have a daily devotion with God and understand Him and He has, he has a conviction in you, does that Bible convict you? <clears throat> Does the Bible convict anybody? Do the words convict you? Will the words save you? Not by itself. It will lead you to something. It will lead you to God because God's Spirit speaks to you. How do you prove that to someone? When that gentleman asked me, give me the proof and I'll believe could have taken the Bible, hit him across the head, here's your proof. Is that going to help? Where is the proof in your worship? In your actions. This guy was a nice guy. He would have helped me, he would have done anything for me. Am I, am I judging his actions? That's the truth he's looking for? I took it to be something more little. If only a miracle could have happened. But Jesus, Jesus scolded the individuals. Jesus scolded the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees, when they came up and asked him for miracles. And Jesus told them, you hypocrites, you liars. You ask for many miracles, but yet you still not, do not believe. Where is the proof? When it says God is spirit, and unless you worship in spirit and in truth, you are not worshiping.
worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. Does anybody have any idea in their lives how that is relevant? God is spirit. Unless you worship in spirit and in truth, unless God has convicted you, you will not know the truth. Unless God has convicted you, you will not know the spirit. And that's what God, that's what Jesus is saying here. Forget what the Jews are saying about you have to worship over there. Forget your traditions of believing you as Samaritans have to worship up there. Unless you truly know God, unless God lives within you, you will not be able to worship Him. Wednesday's lesson. Let's, let's, uh, we don't have much time, so why don't we just go ahead and get to uh, Thursday's lesson. Idolatry and education. Mark 7, 1 through 13. Mark 7, 1 through 13. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, when they saw some of his disciples be bread with the file, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, only the tradition of the elders. When they, came, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received in full, like the washing of cups, pitchers, and copper vessels, and cups. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples, why do your disciples not walk apart from the tradition of the elders? But eat bread with unwashed hands. He answered and said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of the hypocrites as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts is far, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines of the of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, and watching the pictures and cups and many other such things you do. And he said to them, All too well you reject the command of God that you, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses his mother, the father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin, Corbin, that is, dedicated to the temple. And you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed him, and many such things do. Idolatry and education. The ideas here found in Mark chapter 7. What principles do we find in verses 7 through 9 that could apply today in the context of Christian education, the nature of false teaching, taken from the world, that could negatively impact the practice of our faith? Teachings. We talked about compromises earlier. Compromises. We talked about the idea of... Uh, whether or not we might attend another church randomly. We compromise faith. Uh, education. We talk about Christian education. We talk about the compromises there. We talked about the, comp the, the three Hebrews in regards to their life-threatening situation uh, at the front of the idol. Compromising. Who gets to, who is allowed to set the standard of where the compromise starts and ends? Is it different for everybody? Is it the same for all of us? Do I just say, well, you're compromising your faith by doing that? How do you know when you start to compromise your faith? Where does it go back to understanding what compromising is? Where's the basis of understanding what compromising it when compromising starts? How do we alleviate the possibility of compromising?
we go back to what Jesus told the Samaritan woman. It's amazing that maybe this Samaritan woman, this heathen woman, out of anybody, was able to truly understand what Jesus was talking about. Because when, if Jesus was to have told these Pharisees and Sadducees, these Pharisees and these scribes, truly, if you do not worship in spirit and in truth, you're not worshiping at all. Pharisees would have just, whoo, right over the top. But the Samaritan woman... Do you think she truly understood it? Did Jesus talk to her in a practical sense that she truly understood it? Unless you have the conviction in you, whatever education or whatever form of worship you're going to practice is not. Will not be sufficient. It goes back to the very first first of our, of our, of our uh, lesson here. Give to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Oh, worship the Lord in beauty of holiness. And to summarize that in beauty of holiness, does that mean once a week you get that opportunity in worshiping the Lord in beauty and holiness? Is it only once a week? Can it happen any other part of the day or any part of the week? If it can't happen any other part of the week, then what do you consider to be the holiness in your worship? The holiness is being able to find God and to be able to have Him speak to you and be able to convict your life. Because if there is a conviction, there is nothing more holy about it. And you need to ask the Holy Spirit daily to come into your life and help you to be more like Jesus. Right. So every day is a chance for there to be a worship of the Lord in beauty and holiness. It doesn't have to happen in today's ceremony. That's what we're not talking about. It's allowing you to have one chance to have a worship service in beauty and holiness. It's not about this worship service. And that's what Jesus was implying when he's talking to the Samaritan woman. Oh, forget the individuals that believe you have to worship in a certain way, in a certain manner, over here or over there or wherever. The beauty of worship and holiness can happen here right now, wherever you're at. At the well, it can happen anywhere, as long as there's a conviction of Christ. Let's end with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we can open up your word and come to an understanding of how we can better worship you. We ask that in our hearts and our minds that we open up the ability of you to work in us, to work in our lives, that we can come to you and lift you up in a, in a, in a holy manner, in a personal manner that we come to you. And we ask for your leading and guidance in whatever we do. Thank you in your name.